Our sense of self comes from our measure of control that we have over our environment, over our bodies, over our thoughts. Your sense of you meditating right here comes at least from the fact that you know you can focus here or you could focus someplace else. You have the choice. And you're choosing to stay here. And you can change the way you breathe. You can change the perceptions you have around the breath and how you're relating to the body. Whatever sense of you you have right now comes from control. We exert this control to find happiness. And it's in this way we develop the three main roles of our sense of self. There's the self as the producer that has the ability to exert control. There's the self as the consumer, the part that's going to benefit from the control. And then there's the reflective self that watches the other two to see how well the producer is producing and whether the consumer is satisfied and where improvements might be made. This is where your sense of self begins to develop more in the abstract, as you think more in the long term. Most common animals are confined to the first two, but they do have a sense of self. I remember reading a Zen teacher one time saying that animals don't suffer because they have no sense of self, but you look at animals and they're suffering a lot. And even though they may not have an articulated sense of self, they do have a sense that they want to control their environment, and they're very upset when they can't. I remember reading of a penguin researcher one time who was talking to a journalist. He was doing an experiment on penguins to see what kind of diet they had. It required picking them up, turning them upside down, and shaking their, their food out of their stomach. He said he hated doing the experiment because it violated their sense of self. The reporter thought that he was exaggerating, that he was getting a little crazy, being around penguins too much, reading too much into their, into their behavior. But as she got to them, she realized well, penguins do have a sense of self. They have their sense of their own territory. Every animal has a sense of territory. What's that? Not a sense of self. This belongs to me. Don't violate this. And some of the more advanced animals do have a more reflective self as they try to figure things out. So the sense of self is everywhere in beings. As the Buddha pointed out, it's made out of five things, the, the five aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. Your sense of self as the producer, for instance, lays claim to the body to do the actions that need to be done. Notice how much pain is involved in doing whatever needs to be done. This is the self as a reflector is going to take note of this. It has to employ perceptions and thought fabrications in order to figure things out, and it is aware of what's going on. The sense of self as a consumer may have the body being satisfied with the food that's found, very much identifies with the feelings of pleasure or pain, and will tend to fabricate a lot of thinking around pleasures and pains that you've had. This is where we may tend to exaggerate how wonderful something was, as a way of motivating the producer to produce more. And of course, is aware. The reflective self may not identify so much with the body, but does employ a lot of thinking, perceiving, consciousness. As it figures out, is the producer doing well? Could it do better? So 
to employ all these aggregates as our strategies for happiness, and we cling to them as a result. And because they're strategies for happiness, abstract arguments that say there is no self really have no force against them. Even the people who say that you're just the body, there is no self in there, they're saying right there, okay, you are your body, you're going to identify with the body. And of course they employ the aggregates in just the same way as everybody else to find happiness on a day-to-day -day basis. So even those who say from the abstract there is no self, that makes no sense, that's illogical, they end up going back and acting, using the self as a strategy, various senses of self as strategy. The only way we'd be willing to let go of these strategies is if someone could convince us that there's a better way to find happiness. That's precisely what the Buddha does. As he told the monks one time, what isn't yours, let go of it. It will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. That's the motivation for using the not-self perception, the not-self strategy. And Four Noble Truths are basically an explanation as to why you might want to let go of your sense of self. As the Buddha defines suffering, suffering is clinging. And clinging to a particular idea of self is one of the forms of suffering. It goes against the grain, but depending on how reflective your reflective self has been, you would be more or less inclined to listen to his arguments. This is one of the reasons why he gives the graduated discourse, to point out that even the best forms of happiness that can be found as you practice generosity, virtue, thinking of long-term happiness, and being in a position where you can gain long-term happiness for yourself, will have their drawbacks, their degradation, he says. And when your reflective self agrees, that's when you're ready for the Four Noble Truths and that teaching that goes against the grain, that clinging to a sense of self is suffering. In the case of the Five Brethren, he taught them right view, made no mention of self, and got them to an experience of the Dhamma Eye, where they actually saw the deathless from accepting his teaching on right view. So they could see, yes, by letting go of the clinging, letting go of the craving, you do find a happiness that's a lot better than anything else you've had before. It was then that he taught them not self. Some people will say that when you gain stream entry, gain the Dhamma Eye, that's when you see there is no self. But if that were the case, he wouldn't have had to teach them not self afterwards. He taught them not self afterwards because they needed to have right view the teaching on not self to make sense and to have some strength against our deep-seated assumptions that it's through clinging to an idea of self that we're going to be able to find happiness. In their case, he had showed them no. It's by letting go that you can find the deathless, and the deathless is much better than anything else you can attain. That's when they're willing to look back, see whatever lingering sense of self they had around the aggregates was really not worth holding on to. They had let go of the idea that I am this, but they still had a lingering I am, which another monk once later compared to the scent of soap. You've washed the clothes. The dirt is gone from the clothes, but there's still a lingering scent of soap in the cloth. So that's what had to be taken care of in that case. But the important point is that Buddha's teaching on not-self is not something that's a simply a logical argument that would hold forth in any logical forum. 
we can prove because of X, Y, and Z, therefore there is no self. It's more value judgment. Our sense of self is a value judgment, that certain things are worth holding on to for the sake of happiness. And the Buddha is having us change our value judgment. That actually you're going to do better learning how to let go in degrees. He doesn't have you drop your sense of self immediately. You apply it first to developing a passion for the path. But ultimately you have to let that go, because you find that there will be a greater happiness even letting go of the path. After the path is done, it's working, clearing up a lot of the confusion in your mind. So it's only if you're willing to take the Buddha at his word that, yes, there is a better form of happiness that can be found by letting go, that suffering is clinging. It is caused by craving. It's not caused by things outside. It's not caused by your inability to find control over other people that you should try to control, which is the way most people approach it. You're suffering because so-and-so is out, out of your control, but you're going to do what you can to get them into your control. It's only when you accept the Buddha's analysis that how true happiness is found and what true suffering is. The not self teaching will make sense and will have power within the mind. So, this is one of the reasons why the Buddha was so adamant about focusing on the negative side of worldly pleasures. It's to let people realize that what you're holding on to is suffering itself. He's saying this not because he simply wants to. Bad mouth their pleasures, bad mouth your pleasures. It's because he's got something better. He's saying negative things, but he has a positive purpose. There really is a true happiness, a happiness that doesn't change, a happiness that harms nobody. That's to be found by comprehending your clinging, abandoning your craving. An important part of comprehending and abandoning is learning how to use that perception of not-self and apply it to all the different aggregates that make up yourself as a consumer, yourself as a producer, yourself as a reflecting agent. And so you take these teachings as a strategy. Realizing that your sense of self was a strategy, but with not self is going to be a better strategy. That's when you have a chance of finding what true happiness is. And that's what all these teachings are for. They're for the sake of happiness. It's when you understand how not self relates to true happiness. That's when you can really understand it and get the most out of it.